Greetings friends, it is week two, it is strategy and it is on. So, one of the things you'll notice is that I do tend to throw in an XKCD cartoon as a, a bit of flavour for the content. Uh, this one though is actually a bit of a consideration. I'm going to be asking you to run a project and it's going to run for at least 10 weeks. So there might be some temptations along the way to try and build yourself some systems, some processes. But ultimately, the thing you've got to watch for is when you put more time into the system, then the system's going to save you in operation. So keep an eye on that, even things like bullet journals. Just watch for it, make certain, track it, and know if it's useful. So, it's strategy time. Two things are going to happen. One, we're going to walk you through strategy options. And there are many, several different options that you can take. Second thing is, Every strategic decision needs to output a tactical consequence. Strategy requires decisions. Decisions create consequences. Consequences are good things to have. The consequences of your actions should be you know what to do next. You should get a very clear insight. So with strategy, there is always three generic top level decisions considerations the first is withdrawal as a marketer and as a strategist i will always say that your first choice in a market is do i still want to be in this market it is always fair to build a strategy that is not nah, i'm out so you want to think about that you are not obligated under circumstances to stay in a market now if there are contractual obligations service obligations you go see your contract out but as a marketer under no circumstances are you obligated to go for growth or go for maintenance if withdrawal is the better strategy so this is your strategic decision making your second choice is that it's always fair game to go for a maintenance strategy and maintenance is the idea that you're doing okay and you want to keep doing okay and okay is just that if you're on break even to minor profit you're done you don't have to go well why don't we we're doing sustainable adequate profits uh, break even and profitability let's gamble it all on a massive big profit that might not pay off and lose everything or let's roll with what we've got the third strategy and the most common strategy and the one we're most used to is growth. Unfortunately, back in the 80s, and this is my generation's misunderstanding, there was this little movie called Wall Street. Uh, it's a historical classic in the economic comedy genre. And in that, the villain, the notional bad person of the film, had a catchphrase, greed is good. And they were growth at any costs was their notional catchphrase. Unfortunately, the movie, because it was misunderstood as a documentary, not a comedy, uh, led to a rise in growth at all cost mentality in the business community and in a lot of business schools. So we saw the advent of a number of models being promoted as the only choice and that growth was the only way. And we ended up with this really stupid statement, um, if you're not growing, you're failing. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. And I've heard some really dumb things. I've been on the internet since the 90s. I've seen some very dumb things. Growth is one of three choices. It's not the only choice. If it was the only choice, it'd be a compulsion. So I want to introduce you to my favorite old school uh, technique, and this is the GE Finance, AKA the McKinsey Matrix. Uh, I love this thing, and I've used it in my own strategy text back in the day in the early 2000s. Late 2000s, yeah, in the thousands. The idea here is that you have a judgment to make, and that is your capacity in a market against your return on effort. And you will see that you have choices of divestment, of harvest, and it's red, orange, and green. Now, green is not growth per se. 
High strength, high returns, focus effort, it will probably lead to growth. If it's a high return marketplace and you're good at what you do, chances are it will facilitate you doing more of it. So there will be positive consequences. If you're in a high return, but you're in a mid capacity, you're okay at what you do, but it's a rich market, then you probably should get a little bit better at what you do and try and cash in. If it turns out that you're in a really good, big, valuable market, but you're just bad at what you do, and you don't have a strength in this area, you can elect to specialize because the market's big enough that your small thing that you do okay could draw a large enough audience. But it's a mid-tier strategy. It's not, uh, it's not necessarily one that you want to retain for an extended period. Also, because you are able to move between strategies. So one of the things that can happen here is that you can go from your specialist niche in a low strength, high returns, and you can get better at it, and the market stays the same, and you move up into a medium strength. Well done, congratulations, enhance the strategy. Or the market can decline and your specialist niche can be one where you're like, do I really want to stay in this? Yeah, it was good for the taking whilst the taking was good, but I should probably withdraw. I should get out of this market. Equally, if you're in a low return market and it's a low strength, get out. You, you can divest. You don't have to stay. Uh, it may not suit you. And one of the things to understand is that as a strategist, there are times when you go, yeah, I'd really like to, but I'm, I'm not good at it and I don't want to pursue it. I don't want to put the effort in to become okay enough at it. On the medium strength options, you can go a harvest strategy. Oh, the market's okay, you do okay. Uh, it's not really a lot of effort worth investing in above what you're currently doing because you're on break even. So low return, medium strength, you break even, you do okay. Uh, so long as you're not losing money on it, it's not worth leaving because it's a defensive strategy to stay in the market. And equally, um, if you stay in the market long enough when others are leaving because it's a low return market, you might build up into a defensive niche where your reason for being in this area is to defend another aspect of what you do. Now, in e-marketing, a defensive niche from a social media perspective is occupying a social media account under your brand name that you update infrequently, but you're not prepared to get rid of because you don't want somebody else taking up your spot on that account. Now, you might be an expert with the camera and you're good with graphics and you are visually oriented. So you are all about the Instagram and that's your strength. So you're in a high strength, good returns, you got uh, maintain capacity, but you might also have a Twitter account that you run as a defense to stop someone from encroaching into your space on that side and to make certain that you're accessible to a market and you can relay them back to your Instagram where you're better. So this is a matrix that you're going to revisit a few times along the way uh, and it will come into play late in the semester. At this point in time, what you want to also be thinking about is low strength, medium strength and high strength requires honest internal calibration. It requires you to go, am I good at this? Do I want to become better at it? Can I become better at it? Because there's one other consideration here is that if you're high strength, high returns, you don't necessarily need to invest more into growing. You might be able to capture because the focus Build capacity is where it's medium strength in the firm and a high return market. Build capacity is a growth strategy. Maintain capacity, medium returns, high strength. Maintain and reevaluate, medium strength, medium returns. There's a lot more of break even in this than there is of growth. Now, we're going to talk a couple of classic e marketing strategy frameworks and Having just told you that growth is not the thing that you have to do, if you have an existing account 
and you are working with an existing uh, social media account or an existing project, then you are not obligated to go for growth. If you enter the market with a new account, then you are kind of stuck. You don't get a lot of choice, which is where we, we come to the Antsoff. And it is the Antsoff growth matrix. It is not the Antsoff matrix. It's not the Antsoff strategy matrix. It is a matrix designed to facilitate strategic thought around how to grow. And the choices are in terms of growing audience or audience share. On the screen, there's the familiar four. And that is, do I have a product? Because it's a two question. Do I have a market? Do I have a product? If I've got a market, congratulations. You're either doing market penetration of selling more to the existing, the current product, more of it, which in a social media perspective could be posted more frequently. You could be, you have a current audience, product development. Yeah, that could be new types of content. You're using Instagram, you've got an audience on Instagram. They've come for the photos. You might want to start using Reels, new product for a current audience. If you have a current audience, oh, sorry, if you have a current product, and you want to bring that product to a new audience, that's market development. From a social media perspective, this could be start on a new platform. You've got a successful YouTube account, you're doing a lot of stuff on YouTube, but you know that whilst you're doing your YouTube, you're getting little snippets, little offshoots, small content blocks that you don't have a use for on the YouTube, but they would be able to be used in a different way yeah, content previews, outtakes, behind the scenes, photos, location shoots, and they would work for market development. So you could open up an Instagram account to develop a new block of content options that you could then link your, say to your current audience, hey, you should uh, subscribe to our Instagram. The last place is if you're starting and you have no audience and you haven't answered a new account, welcome to diversification. You're stuck in it. The thing about diversification is that it's very, if you get through the first thing, it's very quick to be able to go from, I have no audience, I have no product, to I've been making product, and I need a new audience for that product, market development. I've been making product, I've got an audience, I'm gonna make more of this product for this audience, market penetration. I've got an audience, they want some different things, I'm gonna make them some different things, product development. So the four options are in play. For you this semester, you're going to present a strategy as to what you're going to do with your project for 10 to 12 weeks, maybe beyond. So this is where you've got options. If it's a fresh account and it's a day zero, you're on diversification. If it's day one or later and you have an audience or you have a product, congratulations, you're either building your audience or you're building your product you're unlikely to be going completely afresh again. If you're in a market that's crowded and has been going for a while and you've reached the peak of what you can do, then you might need to look for either a new audience or to spin out something new if the market is saturated. If you've run out of ideas um, and you just know that you do what you do, you do well, then keep doing it. There is no compulsion to create new products. That's a fair, legitimate and reasonable strategy to go, I'm good at what I do and the market likes what I sell. I'm going to offer more of the same to the same people who are currently buying it from me and hopefully they'll buy it at bigger volume. Or similar people to the audience I'm currently addressing will like the product I'm currently offering. I'll expand my audiences. Uh, yeah, if you're on YouTube, you may one day find yourself in diversification because you have to, because YouTube just upped and cancelled your account. Uh, social media's risk scenario is that some days you just don't get a choice in it and you find yourself on diversification. New name, new brand, trying to regain your audience because someone somewhere in an automated system shut you down. If it happens during this semester, talk to me, let me know. We'll figure something out for your assessment. All right, so your familiar, 
if you've done intro to marketing or marketing strategy, you'll know that there is the Porter models. There's the Porter's Five Forces, there's the Porter's Generic Strategy. In Porter's Generic Strategy, there is some value to be had for e-marketers. Now, product differentiation is a really interesting way of doing things. It's very customer focused. And I think it would be a viable, possible way that you could pursue a project for 10 to 12 weeks. Your plan is to be valuable to an audience, specifically valuable to that audience, and consumer centric. So you really want to be tight on your market segmentation. You want your STP, segmentation targeting positioning to be absolutely on the money and your co-creation of value needs to be very much driven by what's happening from the audience. So you want to tap into that SIVA model as well to do your assessment. Your second thing to understand in product differentiation is the split between objective differentiation and subjective differentiation. On the objective level, it suits physical goods much better. Uh, you can product differentiate on objective grounds. N number of posts by, we will run 100 posts and our nearest competitor does 80. Is, that's an objective difference. Is it useful? Do you, the audience want more or would the audience like less? Uh, so what you're looking for here is understanding where's your relative advantage. So you're back to bringing the Rogers 95 across. What's the relative advantage that makes your product better? What is your subjective differentiation? What makes your offering of value more conducive to co-creation with your audience than something from your competitor? Again, really driven by your fundamentals and your basics here, segmentation, targeting, positioning, what makes this valuable in the eyes of who you're trying to appeal to. The second option that's in the Port of Five Forces is the dangerous option. And I, I cannot stress this enough. This goes wrong on a routine basis because cost leadership does not mean make it cheaper for the consumer. Cost leadership means that for every dollar I spend, my competitor is spending more than a dollar. So if we sell equal units, I have a better profit because my costs are lower than their costs. Not my prices are lower than their prices. So it's harder to do this in a social media sense, except Say you're a lifestyle blogger and you get into doing travel blogging and travel vlogging. If you're paying for everything yourself, you're going to burn through capital before you possibly start getting your freebies that will keep the system rolling or getting your sponsorships or getting your revenue. Uh, if you can run cheaper than the next nearest lifestyle blogger, then you can outlast them whilst you're waiting to take the market share. But quite often, I, I would say that this is probably the hardest approach to take because you're very driven by what your competitor is doing, matching them in the marketplace, but making certain you're cheaper to produce than they are. Which also means you need to do a lot of research into what their costs are, what their assessments. Don't think it's the best choice you could make, but it's still, it's a valid, it's a porter's it's valid as an option. I just don't think it's the easiest option. Now, the easiest option on e-marketing is niche. There's no two ways about it. Um, the internet's a weird place full of weirdos like me and you and your family. And it's 20 minutes on Facebook on someone else's uh, uh, timeline and looking at their friends of friends of friends. And you will know that there's an absolute market for minions based memes. So you know that there's a bunch of people out there who get super excited about animated lawn gnomes talking smack about things. I don't get it. It's not my niche. On the other hand, I have a whole bunch of niche interests. I am very big on uh, professional wrestling and I have a particular 
uh, follow a number of professional wrestling accounts who wrestle in very small federations over in the US. So I'm into like hipster wrestling. So specialist market niche. The hipster US wrestling community has me as a customer because they're on the internet and I can pay them money. That's what you're looking for here. You're looking to go away from your standard segmentation variables of geography, demography, even psychography. And you're looking for consumption based, interest based and usage based. So niche marketing as a strategy, I think is very viable. The other thing to consider about niche marketing is that when you go back and look at your GE finance matrix, a small market for which you do well in is a green light. Uh, but you can also then expand into other markets that you perhaps don't do as well in, but are sustainable because you've got a core and then you're offering a slight variant on that product to a new audience. Key here is to be able to understand the needs and to also not outgrow your market's capacity. Uh, this is where growth at all costs is a dumb idea because it's contradicted by niche, which is specialist needs, narrow focus. Now, the other thing on the specialist niche, uh, it doesn't stop you from using larger intermediary systems. Etsy, eBay, SoundCloud, they're the first three that come to mind for me where there are categorizations and subcategories and niche opportunities. You can create custom handmade, handcrafted goods, find your niche on Etsy and link in, get yourself tucked into a corner there where people want to pay $150 for your uh, handcrafted burnt wood objects because that's what they're into. They're into carving wood with fire, sell it to them. That's value co-creation in a nutshell. They want it, you can provide it, and they're gonna get benefit from it and they'll pay you money for it, do it. Equally, larger intermediary systems like an Instagram platform allows you to niche through hashtags, through acquiring an audience that is interested in just the type of content you're providing. So niche marketing doesn't require you not to be on the big platforms. It requires you to know what you are creating has an audience, but you don't have to have that audience be very large. All right, so that's the, the generics coming into a couple of things. In this season, you are tasked with creating a project and that project needs to have a set of objectives. Those objectives need to be then graded by you against a set of metrics, which in order to create metrics, you need clear objectives. So I want to refresh your memory about, uh, you would have come across the SMART mantra. Specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, timetabled. We explain each item as a bullet point. We apply this platform as a heuristic. It is a singular judgment. It is an evaluative tool. It's not best served as SMRT. It's not how you break up, look at it and go, oh, I've got an objective. I'll make it smart. I'll make it measurable. Then I'll write down the measurable bit. I'll make it attainable. I'll explain how it's attainable. No, go the other way around. Write something, write an objective and say, this is what I want, I want to achieve. But have, make certain it is what you want to do. So that's clear. When you want to get it done by, that's a timetable. And a sense of, do you have the resources to make it possible? Attainable, realistic. Is it doable? Oh, I'd like to achieve 101% in Stephen's e-marketing subject. Not doable goes up to 100, stops there. Even though there are 110 points that can be scored across the course of this semester, there is a cap that does not allow the system to go past 100. So if you set a goal of, oh, I want to get 100% in this subject, oh, look, it's attainable, it's timetable, but is it realistic? Like, do you want to put that much effort in? In your project, SMART exists to make your life 
easier so that when you set a goal, you know what you want to achieve. You want to know how you will find out if you're on track or not. So measurables key can be something as dirt basic as there's a ticker box list that you can use to keep you on track. Realistic is a judgment. Attainable is a judgment. It's a resource versus time versus capacity. And it also ties back into that first statement in that GE Finance Matrix, where it's that internal analysis of what is my strength in this area, low, medium, or high? If you've got yourself a low area, then you know you've got to tone it down on what you think you can achieve. And lastly, timetabled. Mission critical to you because you've got a couple of preset deadlines. Uh, one's the end of semester, and one is the ETPR, and that's got a due date. So you've got to have a metric done by then. All right. In addition, one of the things that I want to draw your attention to this season, I will ask you to use theory in your assessment tasks. In your e-taper and your ET, you are asked to use citation. To do that, of course, I should probably tell you what I think you can do with a citation. And this is where theory and application is really fun, is that it is one of the best ways to practice value in use. Merely downloading a PDF file doesn't do anything. It's really annoying. We're not at matrix level yet. Jeez, I wish we were. Um, you download your PDF. It's on your hard drive. You crack it open. You get your notepad out. Because what you're looking for, a theory in marketing, it's a justification, or it's an explanation, or it's a definition. But it's also inspiration and opportunity. What you want to do is take an existing thought someone else has had and make use of it. Turn it into a building block. And we're going to use an example here, and this paper will be available up on the Waddle site, or you can find it from its reference. Here is a paper on entrepreneurial orientation and the three Porter's generic competitive strategies. Now, you may not think of yourself as an entrepreneur. You're about to run a small social media presence for an extended period. And you may not self-ID as an entrepreneur. And that's okay. What you want to do is you want to look at this paper and say, well, what can I take from it to use? What can, what's of benefit to me? And it doesn't have to be the total paper. It doesn't have to be a sentence. And I'm not a big fan of direct quotes, so I'm not all about the copy out a sentence and paste it into an assignment, because that's dumb and gets you a plagiarism punch in the face. Um, don't annoy, turn it in. doesn't need it. Instead, what you can do is you can look and say, well, what can I learn from it? What can I use from it? What's an idea in here that I can apply with acknowledgement that I'm using, I'm influenced by this paper, that this idea has been helpful? And that's what the citation is there for, is to acknowledge where you have gained from the works of others. Also, from a straight out consumer behavior, innovation, adoption perspective is if someone's got an existing answer to your problem, congratulations on going from discontinuous to continuous or dynamically continuous. Congratulations on scaling it down on its difficulty level so you can scale it up on how well you solve it. Now, on this paper, in the Anwar and Shah paper, I want to say that there are a couple, look, there's a bunch of different things. For me, when I read the paper, I looked at this and said, it's really interesting. They've gone and validated the three frameworks. And they've got a rank order in terms of differentiation, cost, leadership, and focus. And now I'm looking at this going, well, that does make it interesting. I've got a justification for my strategic approach. I want to do a cost. I don't want to do cost focus. I don't think it's um, the most beneficial. Therefore, because it's come second, it's ideal for me to say, ah, cost leadership's not the leading approach. Equally, I could say differentiation is a leading approach, or I could justify my focus. You can use a paper like this to justify a decision of this is the strategy I want to take because 
based on the works of these authors, it is beneficial. You know, strategy for the generic competitive strategies in Anwar and Shah have been given a rank order. Then you can now go use that rank order to validate the decision that you want to make. Equally, if you haven't made a decision, you're reading through and you're reading through different strategy papers and you're like, these resonate. This is the sort of, I want to go a bit of an entrepreneurship approach here. Ah, differentiation seems to be the way to go. Which, by the way, makes a lot of sense for entrepreneurship. An entrepreneur is trying to create a new product. An entrepreneur is trying to solve a problem that hasn't been solved by someone else. So that would predispose entrepreneurs towards the value of new audience, new product. Again, crosswire and interlink. Your training and your practice here is to find those crossovers. Last thing I want to say on gathering a theory is make certain you've got, uh, if you're either on the ANU campus in the ANU IP range, or you've got the ANU VPN, have it active when you're going and doing a search on Google Scholar, because you will get access to the journal articles. Each journal article is worth about $35, uh, 35 euros, about $50 uh, US, give or take. Uh, general paper authors see none of that money, it all goes to the publishers. So don't give them the money directly. Use our library subscriptions here. We drop multiple millions of dollars a year on access to journal articles. So whilst you're here and you ha can get to that content through the ANU license, use it. There's a lot of money has been invested in creating these papers. There's a lot of money that has been spent on giving you access to these papers. Download and save PDF to the hard drive, read the files, implement the ideas, and you will have a much more fun semester because the purpose of the research is to make it easier. We want to put your cognitive load and your cognitive effort into the content creation. We want you to be applying these tools, not struggling to build your own tools in the first place. So if you had to, if you were tasked with building a house, we wouldn't expect you to go and try and create your own nails and build your own saws. We tell you, hit up Bunnings, get the supplies, get in there. That's the equivalent. Hitting Google Scholar is the equivalent of hitting Bunnings before you're going out on a hardware. Something requires you hardware. So have a look, give it a go, and try it out. And with that, if you need me, either through the Padlet for follow-ups on the content, on the forum for discussions about ideas raised, on the socials, you'll find me under my name, or direct off an email, and there's consultation times through the Waddle site. And with that, we're done.